Good afternoon, honorable members of parliament who are here of the executive and the judiciary, political party leaders, and uh, members of civil society, of academia, our friends in the media, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. I'm very delighted to welcome you all today, this afternoon, to the IEA series of seminars on reviewing Ghana's 1992 Constitution. Today, we are here once again, extremely privileged to have none other than our religious leaders um, coming to give us their views and reflections on reviewing Ghana's 1992 Constitution. I'm very excited about that. I can't wait to hear from them what they have to say about the Constitution. I'm sure you are too, isn't it? We have heard from so many people, the students, the youth, um, political parties, uh, our own Justice of Kufu and others. And so today is the turn of our religious leaders. And I'm very pleased to introduce to you our five speakers for today. And they are all on the high table. From our left reverend, Dr. Lawrence Tetter, president of the Worldwide Miracle Outreach. Please join me. Thank you. And then we have Sheikh Areme Yao Shaihu, spokesperson of the National Chief Imam, here with us as well. And then we have Most Reverend Dr. Paul Pabna Boafu, presiding bishop of the Methodist Church of Ghana. Very welcome. Namaubi Mohammed bin Sali, head of the Ahmadiyya Muslim Mission in Ghana. Very welcome. And last but not the least, Apostle Eric Namiche, Chairman of the Church of Pentecost. Today is none other than our eminent immediate past Chief Justice of the Republic of Ghana and a distinguished legal scholar here at the IEA, Her Ladyship Justice Sophia Kufu. Please join me. Exercises started 
a while ago uh, on a national basis with the Constitutional Review Commission. But uh, this report is still just gathering dust on some uh, shelf somewhere uh, for reasons that vary. It depends on which side of the political divide you are as to why it's, it, it has not moved forward. So it's not as though the work we're doing here at the IEA or through this, these uh, uh, seminars is to come up with something new. Maybe we'll come up with something new, but we are still we, keep, we still keep the recommendations contained in the report of the commission in mind. And time has passed. Recently, I was uh, having lunch with the with the chair, uh, Professor um, uh, Fiajo, and he said, "Yes, look at it and rip it apart." A lot of time has passed since then, if nothing at all. IT is doing things we didn't dream they will be doing at that time. So what we're doing is certainly very important. And uh, after we have gone through the various uh, programs that we have uh, already drawn up, which will be by, by September, we would have finished gathering the views. Then we will put everything together and begin to have a real national dialogue. Sometimes when the, the, the requests and the requirements and the needs are expressed from downwards to, to, to the lawmaker, it works better than the lawmaker imposes it on, on you. So I'm happy to welcome everybody here today. And uh, without any uh, further ado, I hand you back to Dr. Mami Adwa, J.T. Nando, to continue with, the, with today's program. Thank you very much. Please join me in welcoming Reverend Dr. Lawrence Tete, President of the World Wide I want to say, for some of us, it's an honor to also contribute to what has already been made here. I'm very grateful to, to see my, my mentor and my brother here, Uncle Sam. Please put your hand together for him. These of us, as young men who have come from this background, took a lot of expression. I'm always privileged to say this to you. So you are like my father. Of course you are. My presentation here has been very brief. And uh, your leadership, I wondered how I can put together a message in 50 minutes as a teacher. Unfortunately <laughs> for me, I trained as an economist and specialized in national relations. So I'm not here to preach. I'm also an academic. So I was very mindful in putting together a 15 minutes message. And let me attempt to bullet point it and I pray to works. My presentation really is on the 1992 Constitution review. And uh, I gave it a very interesting introduction here. This brief presentation is aimed at assessing the impact of the winner takes all politics in some African countries using my nation, Mangana, 1992 constitution as a case study. The politics of winner, winner takes all in Ghana has made election become do and die effect because the political party which wins an election will automatically control every sector of the economy. This unfortunate system includes issues of appointment and assessing power by the president. The court that excludes other political parties and members in the opposition in governance, and that gives our presidency, our executive, an excessive power. So here are the major points. Major points for constitutional review. 
Ghana has long been ruled by the 1992 Constitution, which serves as the country's supreme law. It was enacted following an extended period of military rule and political changes. The Constitution strives to promote democratic governance, protect human rights, and accomplish national progress. But it is obvious that after more than 30 years, the Constitution has to be reviewed and amended if we wish to improve governance and promote inclusivity. Your Ladyship, gender remains a significant issue in Ghana. I'm happy um, you are chairing it, but if you can say even on the high table, you are the only lady there. You are a minority. <laughs> <laughs> so your know, gender remains a significant issue in Ghana, particularly in political representation and decision making. Although the constitution guarantees equal rights and opportunity for all, women are significantly underrepresented in politics and in leadership. Women make up more than 50%, I think we all know this very well, of the population of most African countries. In order to attain equity and equality of opportunity for women, there is the need for uniform representation of women in all branches of government. And I dare say that the Constitution should be reviewed to incorporate gender sensitivity policies that will ensure women participation in decision making and equal representation in all sector of our society and our community. Ghana can emulate other African countries. And uh, ladyship, I've been to Rwanda and a few countries in Africa, in South Africa, and I think they are doing much better than we are doing here in Ghana. So we have them to at least learn for and clear cut provision to increase women representing in public offices. Something that I think I would strongly recommend. I think that was the only thing we're living here with. That we should be able to give room to ladies. And also, I also advocate that the ladies themselves support the ladies. But there's one problem in Ghana that I've noticed the ladies don't vote for the ladies. <laughs> and women do not really vote for a woman. Your ladyship, the excessive powers of the president is a main point contention in the 1992 Constitution. The President has extensive executive authority, including the right to dissolve Parliament, appoint and remove public officials, and make important decisions without consulting the branches of the government. And that's my, that's limiting checks and balances. I think that's all levels to be so when we read government, we read about the arms of government, we read about the checks and balances. We read about the separation of powers. And of course, with this kind of powers invested into a president, the limits, checks and balances, this power concentration threatens democracy and effective government. The constitution needs to be updated to reduce the president's authority while enhancing the function of the parliament and other institutions. Relationship, religion, and I stand here today as a cleric. Religion is highly valued in Ghanaian society. The constitution guarantees both religious freedom and the separation of church and state. Nonetheless, there are worries that intolerance and prejudice are occasionally justified by religion. To guarantee that religious freedom is safeguarded while prohibiting the use of religion as a tool of discrimination, the constitution has to be modified to create the balance. The value is to be placed on a religious heritage. And let me also dare to say that I am getting very concerned about the number of attention that are given to politicians whose positions are very transient but we don't seem to value our religious leaders. I've had a very unfortunate situation by sitting at a DVD, I can see a young politician say that, no, these places are for politicians. Maybe the kind of people they are talking to 
are people who could have been their fathers, who are men who, but for them, Ghana would have been torn into pieces. So I think some of these things, sensitively, we must look at it not to take the religious leadership for granted, but for the religious leadership, we have no need. We need to approach Christians and Muslims alike. And if you can, please clap for them. So, it's highly valued, and of course, while prohibiting this, we also want to put on record that getting a very good religious setup will help our nation to be disciplined and also to stay in focus. Because there's no more time to go into that, but I have a separate paper that I'll be handing over to the chairperson of the list. But I think I am a little bit worried about how we have sidelined the religious leadership. Think about this before I even continue. When you go to an occasion, His Excellency will be acknowledged. Even MCs and DCs will be acknowledged. And sometimes, in our messages, we forget to acknowledge the religious leadership. But when we die, we bury us. I think this wrong must be con con corrected. And of course, this is the time that we take everything into consideration. Your leadership, decentralization, is a crucial component of governance in development. And although the 1992 <coughs> constitution calls for decentralization and creation of district assemblies, there are worries that the current setup is inefficient. There are requests for the constitution to be amended in order to boost local government rule and increase district assemblies' ability to support growth and service provision. The leadership, good governance and cooperation are still major issues in Ghana. Although the constitution calls for transparency, accountability, and the rule of law, these ideals are not only implemented in reality. There are worries that political favoritism and nepotism undermine the merit-based hiring practices and equal access to opportunities because corruption is still entrenched in our society and we cannot hide from that. It is necessary to review the constitution in order to reinforce anti-corruption policies, improve accountability and transparency, and support good governance policies. The leadership Ladies and gentlemen, nation development planning is another area that Ghana has to be examined and <coughs> modified. There are worries that the constitution provision for the creation of a thorough national development plan has not been effectively carried out. To make sure that national development planning is integrated into all facets of governance, and that the plan is in line the nation's long-term development mission, the constitution has to be reviewed in this area. Ultimately, the 1992 constitution has, instrumental, has been instrumental in fostering posterity, democracy, and human rights. There is a need to investigate and make changes in a number of areas in order to improve governance, promote inclusivity, and advanced national developments. A comprehensive review of the constitution is necessary to address issues including women's rights, as I said earlier. The present excessive power, religion, uh, decentralization, good administration, corruption, and national development planning. A view of this nature will ensure that when we do this review, that the constitution is still applicable and responsive to Ghanaians' needs and aspirations. In conclusion, Madam Chair, I have some bullet points here, and I put it as my conclusion summary. The 1992 constitution emerged out of a revolutionary and a military leadership. And that is what the Fourth Republic has used. We have had President Pedro Rollins, President John Adekun before, President John Ivan Mills, President John Grand Mama, and currently President Anna Hidan In brief and moving forward, our constitution must lay a good foundation for a solid and practical way of maintaining our ongoing democratic 
dispensation. That's one. It must promote and empower the arms of government, that is, the executive, the legislature, and the judiciary. Two, it must encourage and strengthen separation of powers. Three, it must advocate for appropriate checks and balances for governance system in all aspects of the democratic system. And uh, four, it must be sensitive to gender, children, and disabilities. Five, also, our constitution must be crafted to accommodate and be sensitive to the traditional and religious heritage of this asset. Your Ladyship, our continual delay in reviewing the and rectifying the current constitution is a dent on our healing democracy. And I dare say that it cannot be overly emphasized that the excessive powers of the executive undermines the strength of all the other organs. Finally, I strongly recommend that as an emerging economy in democracy, we reconsider the tenor of six years instead of the four years. That will give space and time to put structures in place. Your Ladyship, in view of the 1992 constituency, which is the current legal instrument for Ghana's democracy rule, it is dated, and I want to say this, that a lot of issues that must be addressed will have to be addressed properly. One of the issues that should be addressed is that a lot of you who are very intelligent, very smart, and still able should not be kept up. And I say that's with you here and with Uncle Sam, who the people. Uh, even though you are past 70, your brains, your intelligence, your capacity, and your, your availability. <laughs> Now, as I put on my economics cap, we will wonder where our GDP is in a mess. Because Sam Kudeto is still on payroll if he's on retirement. Gloria Kufu, former G30, uh, sorry, Ma Mama Sofa uh, Akufu, former chief is still on payroll. And if, from the way you can see her, she's like a, a typical government called Lomo Bella. <laughs> So we should preserve our economy and preserve our GDP. And I think one concern, you both agree with me, that in the UK where I studied, I studied at the London School of Economics. And I also studied at Budapest University of Economic Sciences. And so if I look at it, there's constitution in Hungary and constitution in the UK. And having had a chance to travel around the world a little, looking at how Americans handle the intellectuals, I think some of you have been retired to them, unless you want to go Race. But you can, as you can tell, our mama here is not ready to go rest at all. So I think the constitution should make room for that. And also, finally, I want to say that as a people, we should put God, God first. You know, 15 seconds, 15 minutes, 15 days, it's not enough to put this together. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, we have um, the opportunity to hear from Sheikh Aramayao Shaibu, spokesperson of the National Chief Imam. Please join me. Uh, my colleagues on the panel, my respected audience, permit me to start my presentation in a certain style that I'm used to. I may not be familiar with that. So I begin in the name of Allah. Most gracious, most like, we give him thanks and praises. We are all in God's name, good and good. In fullness and perfection, we ask Allah to bestow his recent blessings upon the Prophet Muhammad and give all the prophets. And all those who turn on the path of righteousness to the of judgment. Let me now take this opportunity to greet you all in the Islamic greetings of love, peace, and fraternity. I'll make a very short assalamu alaikum. <laughs> <laughs> that is very easy for you to. Let me begin on a note of appreciation and thanks to the IEA for the opportunity granted us to represent the Office of the National Chief Demand to share a reflection on the important subject of 
revealing Ghana's identity constitution, viewpoint of religious groups in Ghana. Mr. Chairman, your leadership, you all agree with me that this subject sits at the very heart of our collective quest to deepen democracy, enhance peace and stability, and above all, promote sustainable, accelerated development in Ghana. To this end, let me place on record that we commend high, highly the IEA for this bold and forward-looking initiative. This said, Madam Chairperson, your leadership, I want to state how awkward I feel standing here attempt to make a presentation on a subject in which I have very little or no expertise because I'm not a constitutional <laughs> expert. But my consolation lies in the fact that 1902 Constitution, far from being antagonistic to religion, I find it to have some theistic character, as a theistic character. And what is the basis for that? It begins in the name of the Almighty God. So that gives you some consolation. Therefore, don't be surprised if in my confusion, and I'm not able to uh, do it very well, I need to give you more doses of the proteins on the Holy Quran because that's what I know the best. <laughs> Just a few remarks about context. context. When I'm here, I want to also acknowledge my, my uncle and uncle Sam. And all here. The past few months have witnessed repeated public discourse on whether there's the agency to amend or indeed to even overhaul the 1992 position of completely. To state my position, I am not a proponent of the total overhaul of the Constitution. However, I see little wrong with an attempt to address the inherent weaknesses in inadequacies that have the potential to erode our economy, the democratic gains made, cause political instability, and slow down the pace of our development. For it has been argued that constitutions are made for men and not men for constitutions. In this regard, Madam Chairperson, I would just make a few reference to the preamble of the 1902 Constitution, which says, we, the people of Ghana, in exercise of our natural and inalienable right to establish a framework for government, which shall secure for ourselves and prosperity, and to live with and score prosperity, the blessings liberty, equality, and opportunity, and prosperity. Do hereby adopt, enact, and give to ourselves this constitution. Chapter 6 of this same constitution dealing with directed principles of state, state policy uh, was certified uh, 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 Article 35 was two states as follows. The state shall protect and safeguard the independence, unity, and territorial integrity of Ghana and shall seek the well being of all its citizens. We underscore the well being of all its citizens. Furthermore, the 35 plus 5 also states. The state shall actively promote the integration of peoples of Ghana and prohibit discrimination and prejudice on grounds of place of birth, circumstance of birth, ethnic origin, gender, or religion, creed, or other, other beliefs. These principles are germane for ensuring our unimpeded development and happiness as a country. But the question to throw to ourselves is, has the 1902 Constitution really adequately yielded the expected dividend? If it has, why are we worried to talk about whether amendment or overhauling of the Constitution? If it ha indeed had, this subject will not have no relevance, but because it has not, we are hard to 
engage in this kind of discussions for a period of 30 years span of our democratization process. To answer this question, the following areas of our national state of national life may have to be evaluated. Good governance. How far have we gone with good governance? Eradication and reducing corruption. How successful? It is funny and worrying that every successive government had and continues to accuse the previous government of corruption. So if the previous one is corrupt and the present one is so corrupt, so what's the common denominator? <laughs> or the previous one was corrupt, but the next one was more corrupt. So whether more corrupt or less corrupt, what's the common denominator? Corruption. National cohesion. National cohesion, in my, in my estimation, is at a theoretical level, but in practical terms, it is not. Our country is not cohesive, that's the truth. We are so politically polarized, and there's no single subject matter worthy of our discussion that will not be viewed from partisan positions because of the dominance of two political parties, the NDC and the NDC. And in my view, my respected view, the damage that this, this policy that is doing to our nation and the posterity uh, is something that must, be, must occupy our, our attention. <laughs> Sustainable peace, political harmony, how far have we achieved this? Sustainable economic growth. My in my twin brother because every Thursday we share a platform with the It's an economist. We have been told that this is the 17th time we are going back to the end. 17 times. In a, in a country of plenty mineral resources, vast land for agriculture, the forest that we have, the human resources that we have. We have universities here and still count them. From Cairn University to Lemon, UDS, and the rest that we can think about now. How come that we have failed to manage our economy to the level that we are still moving around now to bed for debt relief. No. It's something that must. What are the weaknesses with our, with our constitution and how it applies? So therefore, the reality of our circumstance measured against these conditions listed above shows an intolerably slow pace of progress and development due to some constitutional weaknesses that are demanding urgent attention. To consolidate our democracy, maintain the gains made so far and foster peace and stability, create the condition of meaningful and accelerated development, the following areas of the 92 Constitution may have to be reviewed in my estimation. So I'll just take some, just a, just a few of the areas. My first area of concern is the National Development Commission. It's painful that we have observed over the years that successive governments have deliberately abandoned projects for development that were meant for the larger masses of the people, especially the poor. The current Sagalini project, for example, is a good example. Huge sums of money have been expended. But it is taking us how many years to review and see what are the corruption areas in it that can be addressed? How many years does it take a government to be able to find out even if you are in doubt about the transparency and accountability of the project so that we don't leave that project to waste our way? Anytime I'm traveling along the Flower Road, at the time I didn't know about that project, but 
from far away, I saw its beauty. Until then, in the public discourse, we got to know that this, this, this is a state project for us. And there are other, other projects uh, that we are unable to. This, the sugar factory in, 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 in Comenda, for example, is, 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 is one of sorts. We are still importing sugar. Every single item used by Ghanaians is imported. Even our handkerchief. <laughs> handkerchief. Cloth that we cut four square. Cloth that we cut that a tailor can sew. We import. Toothpicks are imported. Tomatoes are imported. Toothpicks. <laughs> so, so everything about us is imported. So what is happening to us? And so the sugar factory. In my early days of surgeon, I worked in the Comedy Sugar Factory as a laborer. Having finished Form 4 in 1973, um, the, the family was not well financially sound, so I couldn't. So I stayed in the house for six years before I attended the training, training in 1973. In that interval, I worked as a laborer, as a, as a laborer, as a casual laborer at the Comedy Sugar, sugar, sugar Factory. I was a very smith, and I, I, did, I belonged to the out west department of the bank. That's why I can speak funding. <laughs> um, so, so that old factory grounded to a halt. And at one time in our history, in our economic, the drive to improve our economy, we saw the need to establish a new factory. Even when we were doing so, we hadn't even think, planned very well to think about how to, to really create the, the source of the raw material that from the day one, that one we start, we are able to produce. That factory is lying fallow in the central region at Comenda until now. We are still importing sugar. We are still importing sugar in this, in this country. And so, if we have a National Development Planning Commission, what should be its role? Article 86.1 of the Constitution provides for the establishment of the NDPC. What was the wisdom or the intent of the framers of the Constitution when they brought this institution? What was their intent? What did they visualize as, as of leadership? Because leadership is about visualiz visualizing a better future. So what, what did the framers of the Constitution visualize? How did they conceptualize the idea of the NDPC, National Development Planning Commission, which is subject to the authority of the President, as indicated in 85, uh, 87 one, where it says, the Commission shall advise the President on development planning policy and strategy. Here, the Commission's function is obviously limited to advice. Advice will be subject to approval or rejection. The president is not obliged, is not obliged to take the advice. That's why it's advisable. So nothing compels him. He is left to his whims, due respect to all presented the past, that what they decide according to their own plan is what happens. So even though we have had this body there, the country has not benefited from this institution. It has become a place where we consign people who have become tired, old people who no more have a place and then just to satisfy and give them place. Remember the former, the former, the former, the former president and the former government decided to embark upon, I think, the 40 years open plan. I had the privilege to be invited to make a presentation on behalf of Muslims as to what do we visualize to be the Ghana that we want in the next 40 years. Suppose that all those views were supposed to feed into what will become the National Development Plan and to guide the way we maintain certain focus and consistency, incremental development. That brings relief, reduce poverty, and brings happiness. But if you, in spite of all these things, we are seeing what we are seeing today, God has been gracious to us, at least half of our peace. I don't know why God has been so kind to us as a country. He's favored us in spite of all this. And somebody has said that maybe God is a Ghanaian. 
So what should we do? There is a need for an enhanced provision, entrenched provision. Now I was in an entrenched position that will make the long-term national development agenda of the NDPC binding on this and any other successive president. We must find a way to fix somewhere we can bind it. That you can't come with your program and abandon an existing ongoing project also meant to serve the interests of the people of the nation. But since it doesn't go with your political and partisan agenda, deliberately you leave it to rot. Only to come and spend huge sums of money again for rehabilitation. I think we have not been fair to our country by behaving this way. There must be a provision to guarantee the constitutional independence of the commission from governmental or partisan political influence. The mode of appointment should also be reviewed to ensure diverse stakeholder representation and prevent politicization. Politicization. Politics is something very good, but in the way that we have done it in the, in the country for the past, if you like, 30 years, has already been injurious to the very spirit and soul of our country. And I think and your leadership, I of late have been saying that is it time that we need to, to really, really put together a new breed of Ghanaian politicians? I don't know what it, what that is, it sounds utopian. A new breed. Unfortunately, unfortunately, these young people who are now at, at the source of our of learning of knowledge have been poached, have been infected <laughs> with those weird partisan political agenda. The nooks have been infected. SRC have been infected. But they have the time and they have the, the time and what they have test on. I can see students who were used to be active, very creative leaders of nooks. Just after their course, they become either in NDC or like MP. That's that's and so it gives me a worry. But is it possible now? Can we really, really say we want to build a new breed that comes into politics with a new set of mindset? That he sees politics not as a means of amassing wealth, but politics as a means by which we render meaningful service to the country. Can we, can we really, the politics of old, can we? So it gives us some nostalgia, actually, looking back at those old politicians what they did. This will help eradication to eradicate, eradicate unrealistic promises of development projects. Some of the, some of the projects that we have mentioned the promises that are very unrealistic. Um, but if, if we put the NDPC in its right positions, realistic projects can be put together and that will become the center of our national development. We'll prevent the abandonment and discontinuity of development programs initiated by previous uh, governments. The next institution that I find very, very important, in fact, I associate sacred character and nobility to it. I'm not sure whether in our national mind and from the way we are allowed to operate that we have really, really associated this character it's nobility and the secretness of it. And that's the Council of State. The National Council of State. 89.1 provides for the Council of State to counsel the President on the performance of his or her functions. We get a word here to counsel. Once again, the President is under no obligation no obligation. Sometimes acting on the advice of the Council of State. Sometimes acting in consultation with the Council of, Council of State. So if these are people for whose expertise in life, experience, wisdom, position in the community, influence, that the state requires to tap into their experiences to the level that they are those put together to advise the first person, gentleman, 
And we must associate some importance, some, some importance with this. But the one who is the president, does he see them as such also? That's a matter of worry. I give the, I give the, the latest ex example. I'm, I'm, I'm an election observer uh, here in, in Ghana and at the international level. The appointment of, the, the latest appointment made by the president, for example, the, to the EC, for example. We are not sure whether the Council of State was the most consulted. But this is a country where we have, for, all, for this long period, we, are, we have been aff aff afflicted with a deficit in, in trust. That's the reality of our podcast situation. There is mistrust. It's something that we are trying hard to overcome as we wait for the next election to come. So therefore, for us to make any appointment means that we must really, really take into consideration the broader interest of the country and can guarantee the integrity and the impartiality of this institution. More so because from a religious point of view and from even from a mundane point of view, peace is something that needs to be preserved. We need to work. That's why religious persons, we are interested in the constitution because of the existential needs of those who follow us, those to whom we, we render ourselves in sermons. These are the people who is every Friday I, I deliver a sermon. My brother, very good friend, he moves across the world, watching on television in many of the places. And some other, my uh, good brother, uh, Bishop, uh, Bishop of Methodist, we've been working, working together. Every Sunday, every Friday, religious people are talking. This country is made up of more than 95% of people who belong to one religion or the, or the other. Therefore, as religious leaders, we are interested in the economic well-being of our people and the peace and the harmony of this, of this, of this country. <laughs> and so the Council of State must really be given its due place in the scheme of things. It is not an ordinary, ordinary institution. So its limitations is just advisory. The president is under no obligation to be guided by the Council of the Order Advice. President's overriding power to influence the composition of the council. The president alone has the power to appoint 11. He alone, 11. And the 16 to be selected also from across the regions, he can be, can be influenced by him. And then the few that follow uh, Pass judges, the IGP, the police officers, and the, and, and, the, and, the, and the military. So, if you have the overbearing influence of the crowd, in the, even in the composition, that's why great respect for members of the Council of State. In my experience in the past, most of the time I have watched when they have come to visit Chairman uh, Rollins uh, of Brother Memory. What I hear from the Muslim what the praises that they are praising him, he has done this, and you have done this, you have done well, and the, the praises, I have listened to news before. So you come like praise singers. We want to see how they can at one time criticize. And where they are these are not being taken, they can in matters of accountability, they can make this public known. Make public other than that, they take the blame if the wrong decision is taken. But he said, acting on the advice of the Council of State, or acting in consultation with the Council of State. So therefore, it means that if the, if the president takes a wrong decision, the Council of State takes responsibility. But I don't think we don't want to reduce, want to reduce this noble men and women of our country to this kind of state. So something needs to be done. Termination of appointment by the president with prior approval of the parliament. The president can terminate the appointment of a member of the council as a state. President can exercise a victory power here where the government forms majority in the parliament. Due to the overbearing power of the president, members of the council may be turned into praise singers with no courage to criticize the actions of the president. 
The mandate of the Council of State needs to be enhanced. You need an enhanced, enhanced empowerment for the purpose of accountability. The Council should sometimes make public the Council and the proposals that they have submitted to the President so the public will, will know. So the review here means that we need an enhanced empowerment of the Council of, Council of State. Let me come to close with this last one, appointment of the commissioners of the Electoral Commission. We all, we are all in this country, we, we, we all see it. The exit of uh, Dr. Farajan created a vacuum. And in filling the gap, there was a back and forth you know, about who bet, better fits. I remember from Godia level, we had, we, had, we had to visit the Council of State with certain criteria for, for, for selection. And we saw Manchala, Manchala Kosai was put there, how she suffered from the opposition at the time. She never had rest until she organized her last election. Happily, the current president praised her that she has organized one of the best elections at the time. Not long, not long after that, the process began for her impeachment and she was removed. So the politicians began, she was removed. And then with the coming in of the, of the new government, a new person, and this new person has never had respite. She has never, never had respite ever since she was appointed. Sometimes I have empathized with her. If she happened to be my sister or my wife, I didn't know what I would be able to speak yeah. uh, for her, for what, what she she been doing. She's been hounded to the point that we are all on board. So, the President shall, acting on the advice of the Council of State, appoint chairman, deputy chairman, and other members of the Electoral Commission. Acting on the advice, the limitation here again, the matters of appointment remains within the power of the President with no obligation to accept advice from the Council of State. Since election goes to the very heart of national peace and political stability, it is important to review the mode of appointment of the Commission of the Federal Commission to ensure one impartiality. Neutrality of the members, no, we, that one you cannot guarantee that. But impartiality, the character of the that the, the, the institutional character is what I'm talking about. The impartiality, public trust and confidence, cure mistrust. And so therefore, there is the need for us to ad advertise any vacant position. In this wise, my view, and I share somebody has also expressed this view, if you can get a certain institution that can be given that assignment, they can now do the vetting. And then finally, the one that is selected can be given to the president for, for appointment. And I think that the Public Services Commission should be one that I think uh, will be able to, to, to help us. Mm -hmm. I hope I've gone beyond the time. So, pardon me. And thank you so much for listening. Mm -hmm. So now we are excited to listen to Most Reverend Dr. Paul Kwabna Boaf, presiding bishop of the Methodist Church of and all gathered here, allow me to stand on the existing protocol and to say a very big thank you to IEA for this invitation to the religious bodies. It has already been said that this country can boast of the religious nature and all aspects of our life is centered. And so to bring us into this discussion is very appropriate. And we need to acknowledge that. We also believe that all these are attempts to find good governance and the God we serve is a God who is always looking for the good of the people. And that is why churches, the mosque, traditional rulers have always been part of government or governance. 
making sure that people live and live right and well. And so to bring us here, we believe that it is appropriate and uh, we thank the IEA for this invitation. My good friend Sheikh said, bringing religious bodies or religious leaders to make contributions to such debates uh, is sometimes very hard because we know how to quote from the Quran and the Bible and not from the Constitution. <laughs> uh, so uh, allow us, permit us to also make a little contribution to the debate that is going on as to reviewing the Constitution, the 1992 Constitution, uh, which has been with us for about three, three decades. Your leadership, there are some few points that I want to raise. And the first one is on the executive and the legislature. With regard to the executive powers of the president, it is our considered view that uh, the addition to the argument for a strict separation of powers between the executive and the legislature, we propose that for the purpose of probity and accountability, the Constitution should extend the time limit within which civil and criminal proceedings can be instituted against the president with, within a period of a decade after his or her ceasing to be the president in respect of any, anything done or omitted to be done for the people. Because the Article 57 says that it is only three years and we think that three years is so short a time for which people can gather their information, go back to look at what has been done, and before they are able to put all these together to come up, the time has elapsed and the indemnity has also come into force. And so we believe that the time for this must be looked at, reviewed, for us to also have people coming into office and setting up and delivering to the needs of the Ghanaian citizens so that they cannot just come and take people for a ride knowing that they can just go scot-free after three years. The legislature is a major area of concern that we believe that needs review. The legislature is independent of the executive, yet the constitution by its provision creates some overlappings of the work of the executive and the work of the legislature. This happens with the appointment of ministers of state from among the majority of the members of parliament, that's Article 78. This is a threat to the independence of the legislature as it has been, it has the potential for creating a conflict of interest where the legislature could unfairly make laws that suit the specific agenda of the executive instead of making unbiased laws that promote the public good and are intended to improve the lot of the citizens to whom they owe a duty of trust and responsibility. We know that the private member's bill mechanism is also bound to work better, to work better when the legislature and the executive are distinct in function and do not have overlapping personnel, personnel sorry, who will be faced with potential conflicts of interest situations. Your leadership. We believe 
that the provision of Article 71 contributes uh, significantly to what we are facing now and needs a review. The need to be reviewed for the benefit of all Ghanaians. The ex gratia paid to Article 71 office holders. As part of the movement have become so attractive that some people will do whatever it takes them to be able to hold such offices and the result is corruption. The president is clothed with powers to determine the salaries and allowances payable to Article 71 holders upon a recommendation by a committee set up by the president acting in accordance with the advice of the Council of State. And uh, when it comes to the Council of State, I think my good friend Sheikh has uh, done a lot on it, and I need not go or belabor that point. Your leadership. The other point that I want to look at is decentralization. Decentralization. A lot has been said about decentralization here at IEA and other quarters. But we believe that it should be broadened in terms of our discussion in the sense that greater civic engagement and participation should be achieved by creating permanent and regular platforms for MMDAs and MDAs engagement with key st stakeholders and the groupings such as the private sector, financial institutions, civil society organizations, religious bodies, traditional authorities to enhance policy formulation, execution, and accountability. We believe that if these are properly addressed, for which we have a broad-based participation, then the people making their contribution to whatever development, to whatever situations are being preferred, they will all come on board and it will help in the development of the community and the nation at large. The next point is on the judiciary. Reading through some of the articles of the IEA, we associate ourselves with the recommendation of the IEA. And uh, we would also like to recommend that the proposed more neutral council be involved in, be involved, and in fact have the final say in the promotion of judges to superior courts. I think a lot has been said in this area. And so we believe that a more neutral committee grouping should be put in place to make sure that this is done to the benefit of all citizens of this nation so that it is not colored or it is not done on any political or other lines. Participation of women in governance. Your leadership. We know the way gender plays an active role when it comes to development. Dr. Lawrence Tete mentioned a lot about that. And we want to add our voice to it in saying that we should encourage more gender equity. And here we're looking at women. Their participation 
should be made very clear in all, at all levels of our national development. So from the society up to the parliament level, their participation must be made very clear and the constitution must capture whatever quotas are put in place for them. And here, we would also want to encourage the education equity where men or boys and girls are giving the same. Recently, we know of institutions or universities that are making sure that the quotas for females and males come at par. And this must be encouraged so that we can have competent women to hold offices so that we together would help in developing our nation. The concept of affirmative action should be given constitutional recognition or object to empower various institutions to utilize this as a tool for achieving equity. In addition, the educational content, for example, in social and civic studies should be structured to have content that prepare our girls, our women, to take up such opportunities so that they can fit into whatever office or position they play. Your leadership, let me now move on to political parties and elections. This is one area of great concern to all of us, and we believe that a review can also take place here. We recognize that suggested rules, regulations, and laws are not enough to achieve the outcome that we build, that will build trustworthy parties and free and fair elections. In view of this, we suggest the following additions to whatever has been made by previous uh, groups. One, strengthen mechanisms of enforcement through regulatory bodies such as the Electoral Commission and INEC and actors such as other political parties. It will be essential that regulatory bodies are empowered with the requisite resources in order to successfully enforce compliance. This must be made very clear. Two, we suggest the increase in transparency and disclosure requirements. Political parties operating within a democracy should be required to know the amount of money that they are spending in the campaigns, their sources of funding, as well as the identity details of their donors. Practical accountability and transparency can be achieved this way. Three, incentives for compliance may also be provided for political parties and actors who comply with their regulations. Incentives such as additional state funding or benefits of equitable nature. Four, civil society should be encouraged to report on issues of political abuse or misuse of funds for campaigns. Civil society and the media are collectively potential powerful instruments for accountability, transparency, and a path to national political and electoral financial responsibility. Five, 
defining a political campaign season, for example, to start six to nine months before the actual election period will prevent a continual cycle of campaigning and waste of resources and time and distractions to the developmental agenda of the state. Because we see that the moment parties come into power, the first day we are thinking about the next elections. And so things that are planned, campaign messages continue to come round just to keep them in power. And we believe that the constitution must come out very clear on some of these things. Establishing reasonable ceilings for individual and corporate contributions to political campaigns, as well as a traceable record keeping system would help. A political parties focus on developing manifestos with strategies that are convincing and appealing to citizens and for which they are ready to contribute. And last but not least, prevent any individual or corporate entities from giving so much to any polit political party that they expect or demand jobs, contracts, or financial benefits in return when the party gets into government. And we are all aware Sometimes we know that these funds go in and as a way of compensation, as a way of paying back, it leads into so many things. Projects are started and they cannot be completed because of what has gone on before. The next point is good governance and corruption. Your leadership, members assembled here, we believe that we have enough structures and institutions that deal with corruption in our country. The resources for these anti corruption institutions must be made mandatory and they must be equipped so that they can deal with every kind of corruption that we are confronted with. And it should be made very clear to these bodies that they should do their work with all fairness and all strictness without any color or party affiliations. My last point, which is so dear to our hearts, is on national development planning. And I think that Sheikh has said a lot. And once we also come to repeat it, it means that is the concern of the religious bodies. It's the big concern of the churches, the mosque, and the traditional people. We see developments coming up with state funds. And when parties go out of power, these development plans come to a halt. So we sink a lot of our monies into the ground and nothing beneficial comes to the people. The National Development Planning Committee must be entrusted with the development agenda of our nation. And this must be made such that no party comes to through whatever plan we have away. Sheikh talked about 
the housing. I always use the example of the dual carriage from and so on to Abiga. We raise our voices when there is carnage on our roads. That is when we see the importance of dual carriages. But a party or a government starts one, another one comes and abandons it. Only for us to come back years after to restart the whole thing or to make sure that the money that would have been used for that project is doubled or tripled. And this we believe that there should be a strong national development planning commission devoid of the parties, devoid of the parties. Because if the government after Kofu had continued, would have been getting to Konongo or would be in Kumasi by now with a dual carriage. Now, as we drive from Mansawan to Africa, you see how smooth it is. You don't face any vehicle, and you can. And that is development. We believe that this is the way to go, that the National Development Planning Commission must have a separate, separate uh, role. Which, so in the light of this, we suggest a review or investigation even of the reasons Article 35 plus 7 is blatantly ignored by incumbent administrations in order for one or both of the following may be enforced. Public inquiry, a fine of all persons responsible for the completion of projects and programs. Because as we know and see, we have schools, school buildings that are abandoned, hospitals that are abandoned, roads that are abandoned, and all of these go to dissipate the bigger resources that we have to develop. And development is what the people are looking for. Madam Chair, the religious bodies are grateful for this opportunity to also make our contribution to this call and discussion for the review of the 1992 Constitution of the Republic of Ghana. Thank you. Most Reverend Dr. Paul Thank you. And so now we are happy to hear from our next speaker, our last but one speaker, Maubi Mohammed bin Salim, head of the Ahmadiyya Muslim Mission. My colleague, men and women of religion, our father. Grandfather, sweet man, son, and you told me something this morning, very clear. This is a nightmare. Thank you. Just to say, Kekunyan, very senior elders, ladies, my brother Ato is here, and uh, 
a cross section of distinguished Ghanaian ladies and gentlemen. I extend to all of you this uh, evening or this afternoon the Islamic felicitations of peace, harmony, and blessings of the Almighty Allah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa ta'ala wa Most of the areas I've been touched on. I promise you, therefore, that I'm going to give you a very brief talk. Because my duty has been made very, very simple. First and foremost, I want to talk on the presidency. The captain of that ship, which is called Ghana. I'm not talking of a particular person, but by constitutional provision, whoever happens to find himself or herself occupying that position. And I believe that that is where most of the problems of this country start from. The famous of this country's 1992 constitution did give numerous not only numerous, but also more deficited powers to a Ghanaian called President of the Republic of Ghana. And those powers are such that one can either do or undo Ghana. If God not being on our side, a day comes, somebody like Hitler arises among us to have this kind of a constitution with wide ranging powers, when God knows what he will do to all of us. God forbid. What I'm trying to say is this, that it is the president who has the right to appoint and the right to disappoint. The, principal, the president appoints ministers, a greater number of them from among the legislature, the members of parliament. Therefore, the scenario that has created in this country is that a whole majority of those who struggle to become members of parliament in our country are not really interested in sitting down there and legislating. They are high ministerial appointments. But when their party wins power, they will be given ministerial appointment. And you watch me very closely and check and study our countrymen very well. Those who were very active during the campaign era, but at the end of the day, their party win and they are not given ministerial appointment. You find that they win their seat and go to parliament, all right, but they will, be they will require that venom of political enthusiasm 
which they had in them. When you see that you start one one day at the same person. And this is a reality. Now, what it does is this that it does a lot of harm to the country. And it enhances the more the position of the president. Now, the president has a council of state. Council of state to un to us understand that it's a group of people of wisdom who the president consults from time to time on very important, pertinent national issues. Even before coming out with his pronouncements. But let's ask ourselves whether that is the case in our country. Because some of the appointments we hear over radio, I dare say that we hear them at the same time with the members of the Council of State. <laughs> <laughs> when as a matter of fact, we should have gone to them for them to give their pieces of advice to the president before he either withdraws or pushes them forward. Now you go back to the parliament legislature, there is a committee set in place for vetting political appointees of the president. They are made up of both part, groups of the, of the house, part, uh, ruling and uh, both sides of the house, ruling and uh, non ruling. <laughs> 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 now, because of the powers that we have given to the president, the Council of State becomes a toothless wolf. Excuse me, with all due respect to the constitution of Ghana and with all due respect to the people who are the Jets and Yemen who find themselves there. Uh, in the uh, uh, Council of State, with all full respect for my heart, it's just language that I'm trying to <laughs> <laughs> But the fact is that they are not the only ones. Because the power pack is so power pack that even the nominees that the president makes to the parliament, for the parliamentary vetting committee to vet them is a formality. Let them vet or no vet. Let them vet and disapprove or approve. They will be where they are supposed to be. So that that system also becomes, excuse me to say again, useless. It's pointless. How, who can tell me whether the recent I, IMF, Bruhaha, and so and so forth we had here and there, whether it was actually discussed by the president or his representative with the Council of State, with the cabinet, and put before our parliament, and whether the outcome was positive as a result of which they perceived it. You and me know that, you know, the outcome was negative. But because of the powers that the president has, 
negative or negative or negative or positive it was going to be and it has become. Now I'm saying this not because I have anything against anybody. I'm trying to draw attention to the fact that we are refusing to do our homework work. We are refusing to lay our foundation, a solid foundation. And because of our refusal to lay that solid foundation, the edifices will keep on putting on them will keep having cracks. From time to time, it will either be the windows that will crack. It will tomorrow it will be the doors. Tomorrow it will be the rear wall, the front wall, and so and so. But that system will continue. Why? I'm talking from a moral point of view as a man of religion. There are powers that belong to God, and there are those that also belong to the human being. It is God who is the real omnipotent. And out of human beings, he gives out a little bit of that his omnipotence to leaders among us to help them lead us and take us on the right channels. If it comes to a time that all those powers that Allah, Allah, all the, God, the Almighty, the Omnipotent has, any single individual in this country also having all those powers. <laughs> as we have today, and I can assure you that you take the 1992 Constitution of the Republic of Ghana and take the Quran and take the Bible, all the attributes mentioned of God in the Quran and in the Bible, they are all found there in the 1992 applying to the President of Ghana. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I'm saying that I'm really not going to take too much of our time because a lot has been said. Now, let's move away from there. In the beginning of this constitution of ours, we declare a name that this country called Ghana is a separate state. Secularity, people have different understandings of secularity. Some believe that when you talk of something being secular, it means you have left God out of it, that God hasn't got anything doing with it. But some of us do not buy those ideas because to have nothing to do with God is atheism. When you are atheistic, then God has no rule in your life. But secularism in the form of management and administration of a group of people is to say that, yes, you are of different colors, different tribes, different approaches to religion, and so on and so forth. But there must be a binding factor. And it is not that your Christian religion that shall be the binding factor. It's not that Muslim of yours that can be the binding factor. It is not the traditional religion of yours that can be the binding factor. But the binding factor can be secularism. And secularism makes room for everybody to have space to maneuver, 
for everybody to be able to have his or her own self-respect, for everybody to have the freedom to worship and profess the faith, the, the, the faith that he believed in. With that chapter on each other's tools, just as we have in Ghana here today, you go to a compound house, half of them are Christians, half of them are Muslims. That is why the premiers of our energy consumption ended up by seeing that Ghana is a secular state. Which therefore means that there is a need for us to continue to be as a secular state. At any given point in time, if we drift away just a little bit from it, which some of our neighboring countries have done, and the consequences are known to all of us in our West, this are separated. We have seen it. In Ghana, with all due respect to the premise of our constitution, and all the wisdom that the Almighty Allah gave them to put into our constitution that is a secular thing. And we have all developed that mindset of a regular people and living with a secular set out. We have become the only peaceful place within this oasis, which is a troublesome one. I'm only saying this to draw attention to the fact that apart from politics, which is a big problem for us in this country, we must pay attention to religion. Pay attention to religion in the form of let us restrain some practitioners of some of our religious bodies Moves, who get so exasperated, who get so taken away that they make fiery speeches attacking people regardless of what the consequences, regardless of whether the nation catches fire or not. They belong to us. There is no religious person in this country who doesn't belong to one religious group or the other. You are in the Catholic mission, you are in the Christian council, you are in the uh, charismatic and uh, uh, Pentecostal council, you have the Ahmadiyya Muslim mission, you have the, the Muslim, 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 uh, Muslim, what do you call it? Muslim, 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 and, and so on and so forth. Therefore, we have the capacity to call some errant members to order to ensure that they do not create problems for us. And I believe, you see, this my brother. <laughs> brother Lawrence said that. I've known him over a period of time. And I've known his mannerisms too. <laughs> Once he has clapped at this stage, <laughs> simply telling him more me is enough. <laughs> <laughs> same message that each and every one of these my brethren they did. No different but to them. And it is for us to carry it out there. We don't only carry it out there, let's implement it. Let's implement it by starting from we ourselves. And I don't want to blow my own horn. Let's emulate the example of the national chief man. We all agree with him. Very good. 
old and weak, with all due respect again, he is my father. But with all due respect again, just because of language, they are the type we call in local tree or chinabo. <laughs> uh, because he's so old and weak that you respect at any moment of now he could pass on. At this stage, for him to be able to leave this legacy to us, with the people of Ghana, we must count ourselves one of the largest people in the world. To the invitation. Your leadership, the 1992 constitution, arguably has been the most enduring one since the attainment of Ghana's political independence. In spite of the initial challenges that attended its drafting, and the GPCC believed that and the Constitution has contributed immensely towards the building of our beautiful country and its democracy. Today, in spite of our many challenges, Ghana still remains one of the most peaceful countries in the West African sub-region, if not the whole continent. The recent killing of a military officer at Ashamai and a reprisal and suggested that uh, uh, we are still not out of the woods yet. But we believe that Ghana is blessed and I give thanks to God for the incisive uh, uh, and lectures we've received this evening. We believe that the Constitution has served us very well, but it has done so for more than 30 years. And we at the GPCC have said that it is our time we considered to make some strategic reviews of all the constitution, certain portions to make it more practical and more inclined to meet our present challenges. We believe that a review of this constitution will deepen the culture of democracy and rule of law. I agree with all the speakers. Ghana has a lot of things to do. Uh, at independence, it was so promising. Africans all over the world celebrated us and sincerely believed that the black man could handle his own affairs. <laughs> but today we see things that doesn't make us too happy. And we still believe that we are capable of turning things around to be Ghana, the true black star of Africa. Reviewing the constitution will create an inclusive atmosphere that will bring everyone on board. Almost all the speakers talked about affirmative actions that will ensure that our women are respected and given their rightful place the governments of this beautiful nation. Certain parts of Ghana are still wallowing in deep poverty. I believe that even as we are thinking about the Vila Constitution, uh, we must also be thinking about things that will make us turn around our economic uh, challenges. Uh, in the Bible, when the people of Israel got their independence from the Egyptians, God of all wisdom also knew that political independence was not good enough. So God declared his own affirmative action to go to the Egyptians and make demands of their material terms. And you know the Jewish people, they demanded until they ruined the Egyptian economy. And with this, they got some capital to begin their life. And ever since the Jewish people have never been classified among the poor. So uh, we believe 
that uh, a review of the constitution must also think about those things that will make us economically viable so that in Africa we will be seen as the true shining star that gave hope to the independent struggle. We also believe that uh, reviewing the constitution will bring decision making to the doorstep of the ordinary person. For instance, in the area of the local government, if the people elect their own chief executive, we believe that it will make him or her more accountable to the, to the people who elected him. We also believe that reviewing the constitution will have to address the challenges that confront the people of Africa. Sometimes we over embrace foreign cultures and try to believe that it will work here. And we are different from the rest. Even though when it comes to human rights, I always believe that it must be universal and everybody must have fair treatment. So, in a nutshell, the Ghana Political Science Council's position is that in spite of the many challenges that confront our nation, we still believe that Ghana will not become a failed state. We believe that Ghana still has great knowledgeable men and women around who are worthy of emulation. And this, I want to make a special mention of Honorable Samoku Jetu, who was also my national <laughs> of the law school. We have former President Kofi around, we have the chief imam, and people like that. We give thanks to God for their lives. Her leadership is still here, and she is as, you know, as alert as she began as a practicing lawyer. <laughs> I want to associate myself with what Dr. Wong Status said. And we don't have to retire judges and ask them to go home as they continue to draw from the national kitty. They can still be working for the nation if we truly want to address our economic challenges. <laughs> so I would say that Ghanaians are good people. We are not that bad. We are hard working. We are ambitious. We want the best for ourselves. And we are God fearing. We compare the names to other people in the sub region. That every cause to give thanks to God. I bless God for the religious harmony in this nation. You see, our fathers here. Chief Imam, the Maori, the representative of the Chief Imam, Dr. Lawrence Sete, Dr. Buafu, and all the men of God in this nation struggles to stay together. Of course, there are few ones whose behaviors are uh, uh, not to be talked about. And I believe that the majority of Ghanaians want the best for this nation. And I trust that with God on our side, we will not fail. May God bless you. Amen.